As Daniel said, I worked for state parks for years before I um, came to my current position as uh, education outreach coordinator at the survey up in Fayetteville. Uh, so when I was at state parks, I started to, I, I had always been interested in food uh, and I had the, I, I had found a report about the site that I was working at called Parkin Archaeological State Park that had reports on the flora and fauna that the archaeologists had dug up, whether it be the flora being the plant uh, remains or the fauna being the animal remains. And I thought I was in the process of trying to create new programs about Parkin, and so I took that report and uh, focused more on the flora, and it became sort of a never-ending project of food stuff. When I joined the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, it turns out that there are at least two or three of the archaeologists that work there that are also really into native food. So I've been able to sort of continue the project a little bit um, because now we do educational programs on Native American food and we have, an, we have a whole uh, educational um, curriculum that's available on our website that focuses on native foods uh, all the way from the very beginning, the hunter-gatherers, all the way up to uh, European contact and how diet changed. And it's like a whole fifth grade curriculum. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But basically, I've been able to continue uh, my experimentation with foods, but it did start years ago when I started working at Parkin and read that first report about uh, the plant uh, evidence that was found for the Native Americans in what's called the Mississippian period. Uh, and that's basically the last prehistoric period before the Europeans got here. So they were already farming at that point. But it made me want to delve further into learning what the people ate even before they started farming because for 12,000 years they were here without farming. Uh, and they were hunter-gatherers for 12,000 years and in that time, they were still doing amazing things with their social um, uh, lives in terms of having very large villages uh, and incredible trade networks. And we're not just talking Arkansas, we're talking the entire southeastern United States. They're finding now that uh, there were trade networks back even in what we call the Archaic period. So there were luxurious goods like copper, and, and Gulf Coast shells even being moved about um, way earlier. So there was a lot of cool stuff going on even when they were hunter-gatherers. So I wanted to see what they were hunting and gathering. Um, and I, like I said, I focus more on the plants, so we'll talk a little bit more on the gathering, although I will quickly mention a little bit of the, uh, the meat. But basically, the American Indians in all of Arkansas and most of the Southeast relied first and foremost on gathered and hunted foods or fished. Uh, and then finally, towards the, the end of the prehistoric period around, oh, it depends on what <clears throat> ingredient you're talking about, but basically corn came here in about 900 AD, which is the end of the woodland period. So they started really uh, expanding their grow, grown foods when corn arrived here from Mexico. Um, but for, so like I said, for all intents and purposes, for like 14, 12 to 14,000 years, um, there, was, there was very little, if any, agriculture. Uh, and, then, and then at about the late woodland is when they really started intensifying their agricultural practice. So I'll talk about gathered foods, and then I'll talk real quick about hunted foods, and then I'll talk about um, grown foods. So the gathered ones, and I have a list, and then I'll go through some of them, the more persnickety ones. Um, slide by slide, but basically there were these things called grains and greens. There was no wheat here uh, in the prehistoric. So it, most of the, th and no, of course, no soy. So the, the, the things that we rely on most nowadays were, are the soy and the, and the wheat, and they did not have anything like that. So these, this list of little barley, maygrass, kinopod, or, or goosefoot, or lamb's quarter, they're sort of all the same thing, interchangeable, amaranth, or pigweed, and then marsh elder, or sumpweed, are the main Things and basically what happens is when they're green, you can eat their little leaves. And then when you let it go to seed, you collect the seeds and, 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 and make a gruel out of them, basically, or make a flower out of them. Uh, so uh, these are things that were, were sort of early spring all the way to the fall. They were things that, that the American Indians could have, um, could have relied on. Some of these things were eventually domesticated. And I'll tell you a fun story about sumpweed in a little bit. But uh, there were also, of course, nuts, and we don't think of, we think of nuts as like snacks nowadays, but these things were very, very important. Uh, I, 
I guess I could have put sunflower in there too because th that's sort of a seed. Um, that, that'll come later though, with, especially with the grown food. But the nuts were actually very important uh, for fats and protein. So the protein, not so much because they got that from meat, but the fat, there was, no, there was no fat in the meat because it was all wild animals except for bear, but that was kind of you know, not as, as common as, as the very lean deer. So nuts were really important for the fats. And then the fruits uh, were the only sweet thing they had. There was no honey here. So everybody thinks, okay, if they didn't have sugar, obviously they didn't have sugar. Oh, surely they had honey. There was no honey. There was a very, very tiny bit of honey coming from um, bumblebees. But bumblebees are not hoarders like honeybees are. And there were no honeybees in North America. So uh, the, the fruits were the only sweet thing. So imagine your, your life without much sweet stuff. Uh, that would be almost impossible to imagine. And like I said, I'll go through those um, piece by piece in a little bit. Uh, most of the grains and greens that they ate are what we call weeds today. So most of these things are things you either pull out of your garden or that farmers spend tons of money and, you know, trying to eradicate. And also agricultural science majors spend their entire, you know, entire undergraduate and graduate careers trying to come up with amazing ways to like genetically kill these things, okay? So it's kind of, uh, you know, a little bit of um, uh, ironic that the things that, 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 that allowed American Indians to prosper for thousands and thousands of years are things that we're now trying to kill. And I think it's because they're really annoying to harvest. They're awful. I think the... Um, the little barley's not so bad because it almost acts, I think, a little bit like wheat. Those little things just kind of fall off. But I think it's the may grass that we actually haven't figured out how they harvested it yet. I think it's got some kind of weird outside, I don't know, like all my biology of plants and stuff, but it's got some kind of like ratchets or something that, that's really hard to remove from the center thing, and then it's almost impossible to get the seed out. Uh, so it's really this awful, awful plant. And, it, you know, if you don't have... Facebook to spend all day working on, then you have time to harvest Maygrass and deal with the processing of it. But now that we have social media, we have much more important stuff to do, so we've just got to go to Walmart and buy our, buy our grains. Um, <clears throat> this is something that is very, very common in everyone's gardens. It's called, um, it's, we call it mostly, I think we call it lamb's quarter most of the time. The archaeologists call it kenopodium. Farmers call it goosefoot. Uh, it's, a, it's a relative of quinoa. So quinoa is still from Mexico, but it's a relative of that. And so um, it's, again, the green is nice to eat. It tastes like lettuce. It's small, uh, you know, much smaller than any kind of spinach or something. But it's sort of that, of that kind of, you know, amount. Um, <clears throat> and then it turns, it, it, you'll get a grain out of it. But it's not, pro, it's not totally prolific as a grain. Like it doesn't make trillions of grains. So I think it's better to eat green. What makes trillions of grains is this stuff called amaranth. And amaranth, you can find this, amaranth, you can find it in the store now. Um, in that Bob's Red, sorry, the Bob's Red Mill bag, you know, the, the hippie stuff. Th this stuff is available um, nowadays. And it's really fun to pop, like teeny, tiniest, the teeniest popcorn ever. Um, and then you can like roll it in sunflower butter and make really good like edible things with it. But amaranth is another really teeny tiny grain. However, like I said, it's prolific. So it starts off real pretty. It comes in all different colors. You can, a lot of people actually grow it ornamentally now in their gardens. I see a lot of master gardeners using this um, in the gardens because you get this real pretty red stuff. I think, uh, I can't remember what that one's called. Me Mexican, I can't remember what that one's called, but it has a very specific name because it's so pretty, everybody grows it. But that's what it kind of looks like when you let it go to seed and dry out. And then if you could see here, you just shake it and just millions of grains come out. And it's very easy to process. It reseeds itself. I had this in my garden for years and years. Um, and by the way, when I was at the park in Parkin, I started a garden. The year I got there, I started gardening. And I eventually got a grant to have a whole new garden space. And we built a not huge, maybe 30 foot by 30 foot, maybe 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 20 foot by 20 foot i never really measured it we built a garden that was a very specific garden space just for the uh for the park to to make all these plants that were and we used it sort of as educational props and things like that so some of the pictures that you'll see are from the garden at park in but this stuff was real nice and it you know you can get a lot of stuff out of it 
uh, one, of my, one of the funnest ones to talk about is sumpweed or marsh elder. The Latin uh, genus species is Iva annua. And this one you can go see at Toltec Mounds, um, Archaeological State Park over in Scott, which is about 35 minutes from here. Uh, Liz Horton, who is our, um, the archaeologist at Toltec, she is a paleoethnobotanist, and which means the study of ancient, the use, ancient use of plants. Uh, she does a lot of stuff with textiles and making cordage and things like that, but she also studies plant domestication. And right now she's in a major um, uh, research program with a bunch of other scholars from all over the United States, and they're trying to re re-domesticate some of these things, and sumpweed is her thing. So she has been growing every single year. She's been growing Iva in her garden at, at Toltec. And every year she goes out and measures. She gets all kinds of fancy metrics about how tall the stuff is and how many blah, blah. I don't know what she does. But she, it's fancy science, because they're always posting stuff on Facebook, like look at when, you know, microscopes and things. And then um, she sends it in to some major database thing that all the other people are working on. And then she saves the biggest seeds from the tallest plants every year. She's been, it's the sixth year she's doing it, and every year she's been seeing the, the averages go up taller and taller. And this is essentially what the Native Americans were doing. They're taking a plant that they know is pretty good to eat, and they're taking the largest seeds from the biggest plant, the ones that make, the, this is how domestication happens. You just take seed after seed that works out, oh, you know, look at this. This one has six seeds instead of five. Let's plant this. And then every year they would keep choosing um, and, and the average of the um, uh, amount of food that they could get out of it, the efficiency of the, of the plant would go up. So this did happen, and you can see it in the archaeology. People actually look at plants from different sites, different seeds, leftovers from different sites, and you can actually see the seed shapes changing, and you know that domestication is happening. Just like they do with domestication of animals, you can see um, you know, domesticated animals lose their horns, so you can see over years and years and years that they've always chosen for the nicer animal that won't gore you to death. Um, the same thing happens with plants, except that plants never gore you to death. Well, no, they can poison you, and yeah, they have... Pigweed does that. Yeah, oh, pigweed's horrible. It's terrible. So, and I think they domesticated pigweed to not have the thorns. So they, their seeds, you know what I mean? And then it came back. So it came, you know, it went wild again because we stopped using it. Uh, so when corn came, everything else fell by the wayside. And they're like, oh, corn, we need this stuff. And they let this stuff go again to the wild. And so they're basically doing experiments to try to re-domesticate this stuff, just to see how it happened, you know, just to, you know, trace it. And it's really cool. So that's why, you know, experimental archaeology is so much fun, because you get to just try it. Because the Indians weren't, you know, they didn't keep their garden journals like we do. So uh, we, we have to figure out how they did it the long way. All right, everybody always asks me about this one because when they see it on my nut list, they think, no. Uh, but eggcorns were an incredibly important resource. And nowadays we only, you know, let the hogs eat it and we watch the deer eat it and the squirrels bury them. But back then we have tons and tons and tons of um, eggcorn, you know, shell husks that have been thrown into trash pits. I actually just saw a mummy from a bluff shelter um, a couple days ago in our museum that had a huge pile of acorns with it. You know, they just, they, I guess, they, I don't know if they did it, you know, for, it was in a, it was in a basket too. There were acorns, just a giant pile of them. So, and those were not burned because it was just naturally dried um, as, as, as was the mummy. So uh, this stuff, these things were really important, but there are two kinds of uh, oaks families, two kinds of oak family, white and red. And the white one is less filled with tannic acid than the red one. So you can eat both of them, but the red ones take a lot longer to process. A lot more water is involved in leaching out the acid. Um, you could still, you know, and if you're, if, if you're, you know, hard up for it, you eat them, right? Uh, and, and don't forget, tastes were very different back then. If there was no sugars, and there was very little salt. There was salt, but it was not as easy to get, you know, as it is now. So I've heard of people, I've heard of Native American recipes calling for ash, okay? So their, their palate was completely different than what we're used to, as, as are other ethnicities in the world nowadays. I mean, there are even ethnic foods now that we think are kind of weird tasting. 
Uh, and so, so you got to remember that these people had different palates. So if you ever had to, you, if you ever tried an egg corn, they are really nasty. They taste like dirt, and sometimes if you don't process them enough, they're very bitter. So bitter dirt, Ugh. but very nutritious. Um, some of the egg corns are much easier to get at, uh, as far as the nut meat on the inside. Like these are good. These are sawtooth. These are the red oaks, and they're not great, but they they were on my front lawn, so I was collecting them like crazy because it was easy. Uh, but the one that is my favorite is a white oak called burr oak, and I, there's not a, I don't have a, a good picture of the actual egg corn, but they're, they're about this big with the husk and everything on it. And this is, this is the cap. The cap almost, it's almost like an overcup oak, if you've ever heard of that one, because um, the, over, the overcup oak has that thing that goes almost all the way around the nut. But the, the burr oak is, is almost as big, and it, it has this giant, you know, these just giant... Um, uh, nut meats in them, so it's just more efficient for you to um, get stuff. So uh, when I experimented, I did not go all the way. I, I'm not a purist. I'm sorry. I'm not going to sit with my rock and, you know, the mono matate and break these things open, and I'm not going to use the mono matate to grind. I'm using my ninja blender, okay? I'm using my hammer. I'm using my ninja blender. But I researched a bunch of, um, most of the time when you're trying to learn how to process egg corns, you get yourself onto survivalist websites. Those are fun. Uh, but the one that I found, actually, is a guy named Hank. I, I, I follow him religiously. I can't remember his last name. His name is Hank. He's from California, and he runs a website called Hunt, Gather, Cook. And um, he, he's actually coming to Arkansas. He wants to find four hunters to pay him $2,300 a piece to go duck hunting with him in Stuttgart. And then he will cook the duck with you, and he will give you a signed cookbook. That guy's got, you know, he's got it going on. Uh, but he's come for the squirrel cook-off in, uh, where's the squirrel cook-off? Uh, there's a squirrel cook-off somewhere in Arkansas, I can't remember. And he came for that too, and he charges like an arm and a leg to go to hit one of his dinners there and stuff. So anyway, Hunt, Gather, Cook, he's, he actually has a really good blog about how to do all this kind of stuff. So I've learned a lot from him, actually. Um, and he's not quite a survivalist, he's more of a... I don't know, like just a nature guy or something. But he does a lot of fishing and he does a lot of hunt. Well, hunt, gotta cook, right? His first cook cookbook is called Buck, Buck, Moose. And I just love, and I have a shirt that says Buck, Buck. He's a really cool guy. But I learned all my egg corn stuff from him. And so basically you get the husk off. Sometimes I, if they look wormy, I'll put them in the oven for a little bit just to kill the worm. You gotta have worms. It's, it's not pleasant, but there's always gonna be worms in some of the egg corn. Um, I try to cut off the nasty stuff, but Basically, you put it in a blender with some water, and then you soak, you leach the tannic acid out. Um, and so, like, when you first put it in, the acid just mixes with the water, and all the water turns brown. And every day, for almost a month, I would pour off the old water and put new water in until it basically became practically clear. Um, but a lot of times, there's a lot of fat in nuts, so you get a lot of fatty water, too. Um, so you got to let it settle out and stuff like that. Now, everybody says, well, the Native Americans didn't have a refrigerator to put their leached things in, because if you leave it out too long, it'll get kind of nasty. Um, but what the Native Americans did have was a river. And so what we think they did was not necessarily grind it up to this tiny. This is just me being, you know, it's easier this way. But they probably just broke the nuts up, had a net bag that they would stake down in the river, and that would leach it out for a few weeks, and, that, and then they'd have to... I don't know, set a kid out on the river to fight off the deer or something every night or something. But we, you know, we don't know exactly the logistics of how they protected their food that they let out to leach. Um, I've read other people say that they just put the nuts in a bag in their toilet tank and every day it flushes, it just flushes. The, I didn't do that. I, I put the stuff in my fridge. But anyway, you get the nut meat and you drain it and then you can either cook with it like a mush or what I do is dry it on my, um, my dehydrator rack, or you can sit out in the sun and let it dry. And then you uh, grind it down and you can make a flour out of it. And I've made egg corn bread. You throw some persimmon paste in there to make it a little sweet. Um, it's not a leavened bread, of course, more like a cake. Uh, but it's, you know, it's decent and it's a good novelty for people to try to eat egg corns. But it's also, like I said, I mean, when apocalypse comes, the, egg, the egg corns are out there. We'll be fighting the deer for them. So they're here and they're a very, very edible native food. Um, you just have to get used to the taste of them. 
The other uh, big one that is, again, there's so much of it and we kind of ignore it nowadays is black walnuts. They're uh, not English walnuts like you get in the store. You can buy black walnuts in the store, but they're quite expensive because they're, they're well, they're awful to um, crack. So this is what they kind of look like when they hit the ground. They're real big. Um, a lot of you are nodding, so I assume most of you know what these things are. But what I did for lack of knowledge, basically, is I let them kind of rot away on that tarp um, until they became like dry and crusty, and then I, I stepped on them. Yeah, that's what I did. I, I mean, people roll over the cars in them in the driveway to get the husk off, but I just basically stepped on them all until I got all the husk off. Um, but for those of you who don't necessarily know about black walnuts, they make an incredible dye. Um, really nice dark brown to black dye. And so they will dye your hands for um, at least a week if you get your hands really deep in them. So you definitely want to wear gloves if you don't want to be answering questions um, for the rest of the time, especially when you work with kids. Why are your hands? You know, just I always try to avoid uh, giving kids any curiosity um, beyond what I'm doing. So uh, anyway, so I got the husk off and then I, I did some, I did all kinds of weird whizzy things with drills that have paint thinner, paint attachments that you mix it up in the water to get the stuff. And eventually they look like that. But it's not, it's, I've never found an efficient way to do that. Some people like dry them out and then break the stuff off. There's all different ways to do it, but they'll last forever. But when you do have to cut them open, um, you can't use a regular nutcracker. You need a, you know, you need basically a hammer and you need a tiny pick. And I guess you just spend, that's what the Indians did all night long. When they had nothing else to do, they would sit and pick the black walnut meat out. I don't like black walnuts, I found out. I don't like them. First time I had them, I thought, oh, these went off. They went rancid, and I'm eating rancid nuts. And then the second time I had it, I said, oh, that's what black walnuts taste like. So it turned out to me that there were other nuts that I liked a lot more, like hickory nuts. Uh, pecan is a hickory, but pecans are much easier to crack, but these hickory nuts uh, shag bark hickory, I think they are. There's all kinds of hickories, but I think this might be the shag bark, but I can't quite remember. We would, we would collect, obviously, wagon loads of these things. They're also pretty hard to crack, though. Um, so really, my favorite Arkansas nut is the pecan because it's easy to crack and it tastes really good. At Parkin, we had two different kinds of pecan trees. We had the wild ones and we had the domesticated ones. Um, so it turned out like some forestry dude came and did genetic testing and found out that the little tiny ones that we were having were probably harkened back to the Indians that were there. I mean, the trees themselves were not, you know, the trees that were there when the Indians were there, but we, the genetics were, and for some reason they didn't cross. I don't know how, um, but they weren't crossing. I don't know if they were, I never really paid too much attention to like flowering times and stuff like that, but the big ones, you know, they're about that big and supposedly, and I, I think I, I confirmed it, they're not as good tasting as the little ones, but the big ones are easier to crack and the little ones are annoying. So it just depends on what you're, you're doing it for. I was feeding a bunch of people, so I was always picking the big ones. <laughs> but for myself, I kept the little ones in my freezer. Um, you know, so, but they, they're a wonderful food and they're, you know, again, across Arkansas, well, at least across in the mountain, mountainous regions of Arkansas, you've got, you've got a lot of pecan. Um, but my house did always look like a, a squirrel was living in it. Um, I collected all year long, so not, uh, not pecans, I collected foods all year long. Um, and so I always had something going on on the kitchen counter um, and I would freeze it or dry it or something like that to keep it because we would eventually have a big um, uh, native foods thing uh, a day that we had a native foods uh, event where people could just come and taste all these things. And I got to the point where it was kind of getting kind of ridiculous. I think I had 101 things on the menu one year and everybody's like, you're doing too much. I said, yes, so I quit. Um, and then I got the job anyway at, at, at the survey, so I don't have to do that anymore. But they still do it, at both at Parkin and at Toltec. They have native foods events so that you can go um, and taste some of the um, some of this stuff. As far as berries go, this is not the best, but it's good for you. So elderberry, um, they're a pain in the neck to get off each one of these little things, um, but they're incredibly important um, uh, nutritionally. I get, they get all kinds of antioxidants and things like that. They also make a nice dye. I've made dye with that. Uh, but my, f basically my favorite is, I almost had to pull over today on 40 because the persimmons are getting ready, okay? So they've dropped, the, don't ever eat a persimmon that looks like that unless you got it from the store, by the way. Don't, if you ever see one of those in the wild, only give it to people that you don't like 
because what happens is that's not ripe and that makes your face turn inside out. That's the only <laughs> way that I can explain it. It's astringent. It's like swallowing a bottle of witch hazel. Um, and it's, it just, you suddenly feel like you have no moisture in your entire body when you eat an unripe persimmon. But when you get them when they're ripe, you need them to look like that. Th this is in a pumpkin. I try to be all cute sometimes. Um, but you want that. And it looks gross. And when I pick them, they're always on the ground. And a lot of people swear that it has to be after the first frost. I've never found that. You can get, as long as they hit the ground and they look gross, and I, what I would do, I would break my back every fall doing this. I would walk around. I mostly went to Lake Poinsett State Park because they had a really good stand of um, persimmons. And I would, I, would, I would walk around bent over like this, and I would smell it. And if it smelled rotten, I'd throw it really far. And then if it was good, I'd put it in my basket. Because I'd come back for multiple days, so I didn't want to keep picking up the same rotten ones, right? So I'd throw it really far. And then I'd walk to the next one and pick it up and smell it. Because you can't really tell, you know, because it does look rotten, but those are all really good. Persimmon's wonderful. Nobody, they, they've domesticated it, and they're Japanese, they're Jap Asian, Japanese persimmon? Yeah. They're, eh. I don't like them. I don't, I'm not interested in them. I'm interested in these wild ones. I think they're wonderful. Uh, and I've, I actually have about six trees right now that I started from seed from wild um, a year, two, two years ago. And they're, they're sad little trees, but I don't know if they'll, they'll make it, but I'm trying to grow some wild ones. Uh, they're, um, you know, I put it through this cone thing, this uh, strainer thing to get the pulp out. I mean, you can eat them plain, but then you can also use the pulp. I make fruit leather with it, so you t pulp it and then you lay it out on the uh, dehydrator rack and, and then you could just rip it and it looks all cute and looks rustic. Um, but that's all. I don't add any sugar to it and that stuff tastes like candy. Persimmons are really amazing. Um, and I put it as paste for people to just slather on the nasty egg corn bread um, and things like that. So the other thing that eludes me because uh, I don't have enough friends in the world, are pawpaw. Uh, they're, when you have a pawpaw tree, well, you have multiples, uh, but when people have pawpaws, they keep them um, secret because they're wonderful, but they are very short-lasting. You get one, and then the next day it's black. Um, huh? It is. It is totally the avocado of native fruit. Yeah, it's just they're really difficult to deal with, and again, they're... Um, they're an understory tree, so a lot of people don't notice them, and then when it's finally time for them to drop, they drop and then the deer and the other animals get them immediately. So you've got to basically know where your tree is and you've got to watch it. Um, and then stand there and kick deer when they're attacking them. So they're, uh, they taste like the mixture between a banana and a mango. Um, they're custardy, so if you're a texture person, this is not for you because they're really like weird texture, like gooey. Uh, but they're absolutely amazing and they are native to southeast Nobody has ever domesticated one, and you can't control them. They have, like, they're annoying. They, they have to have, like, different genetics, and they've got to be able to cross to be able to flower and fruit. And, uh, so I've tried growing them, but I've killed every one of them, unfortunately. Uh, <clears throat> I found this at Parkin when I first started working there, and I immediately popped it into my mouth, and I thought, hmm, I should have asked what that was. <laughs> and luckily, my, my, uh, county, the, our county extension agent emailed me right back when I sent him the picture. I said, are these, Richard, are these poisonous? He said, no, you're lucky though. Uh, so it turns out that, you know, cause I just put weird things in my mouth all the time, but the service berry is the first bloomer um, in the spring. And um, well, with the stupid Bradford pear. So you've got to tell the difference between those, but the Bradford pears are big trees now. And uh, these things are, are they, they become big if you let them uh, grow without hindrance. So they do, these things actually do get to be pretty big, but most of the time people have them as little shrubs. Uh, and they're, they're great. They're really good to eat. I've dried them. I've uh, ground them into things. They're, they're just really good, but um, they're kind of getting, you don't see them very often, so you've got to really know where, where they are. A lot of this stuff is just trying to figure out where stuff is. I cheat. I, I had to make drinks for my Native Foods event, so I did two different drinks. This one is sort of a cheat because we have prickly pears here now, but we, it's not necessarily been confirmed in the archaeology. So, uh, but it's fun to have prickly pears because they taste like, uh, the pears themselves, when they're ripe, they taste like sweet cucumber juice. And they're really good. I've never done anything with the paddles. 
Again, because this is sort of a cheat, but I just had to have some sort of drink. And the other drink that I always used to make was pine needle tea. And it's good. It's, you know. Oh, the other drink I made was sumac tea. Um, and that tastes like the, the, the sourest lemonade you could ever have. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, and everybody's, oh, about poison sumac? Poison sumac has white berries, uh, and, and the red sumac has red. The regular non-poisonous sumac is red. So you can't mix them up, is what I'm saying. I also drank goldenrod tea by mistake once. It was dye, and I pulled it out and forgot that it was supposed to be a dye. Um, and I poured it and fed it to a bunch of people, and I said, ooh, that's not sumac tea. I mislabeled things. And so then I'm, we were Googling, is goldenrod tea poisonous? It's not, luckily, uh, and it wasn't that bad. It could have used, so that was kind of scary. But anyway, um, yeah, should I have admitted that, admitted that on the internet? There's one type of goldenrod in the area. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, I must have gotten the licorice one, because it really wasn't that bad. Like, it didn't, you know, it wasn't. Anyway, uh, I, well, I won't do it again, but it was kind of soapy, too. Did you know that goldenrod has some kind of saponifer something on it? It's, yeah. Anyway, okay, so there's lots of other plants, of course, but we can't. Oh, and everybody always asks me about mushrooms. We don't know. Mushrooms don't survive in the archaeological record, okay? So I always, because I've done this talk quite a few times, and I always get the mushroom question. Sure, I'm sure they ate them, and you could eat everything once. Um, so, you know. <laughs> That they probably ate them once, and then they remember, oh, you know, our great cousin from back then ate one of those ones. Don't do it again, kind of thing, because they didn't survive. So the hunted foods, basically anything that was alive could be eaten. Um, these are the main things that we find in the archaeological record from the bones. But if you ask me, did they eat uh, snake? Yes, they ate snake. There's always they can they, you can eat everything, but in in abundance were the deer and the fish. Uh, nothing was ever domesticated aside from the dog. Uh, so the, there were no other domesticated animals. So anytime they wanted to put something in their mouth that was made of meat, they had to hunt it or fish it themselves. And uh, there was one site in Arkansas where they think they do have dogs that were on the menu. But I think it was probably one of those, like, we're dying, we need to eat something kind of thing. So it wasn't common. So that was the only animal they had with them all the time, but they very, very rarely ate them. So all this stuff had to be hunted, fished, um, and, uh, oh, you know, I forgot to put bison on there. We actually had woods bison in northeast Arkansas, so there were some bison, uh, but these are, you know, the deer was the main thing, and, and then uh, all the migratory birds that come through, they ate a lot of those, and, uh, you know, the, the, and how they ate them, you know, they didn't have, they probably just made stews. By the way, there was no ovens. I don't know if you, you can think about cooking. They, there weren't any ovens that we know of, like no earthen ovens that we've ever found and no like big bread ovens. There weren't ovens. So when I was trying to like remake some of this food, there's n n nobody really has much information. So we just kind of like went with some of the Native American recipes that modern Native Americans make, but then we had to extract all of the European ingredients. So it was kind of like, basically we came up with stew. So I, I basically just always made stews, or we, I had one person, uh, one of my friends would always bring roasted uh, venison, so he'd make a giant venison roast and we cut it up. So you can roast stuff in the fire and whatnot, but basically I, I crock potted a lot of things and, and just mixed stuff together that I thought sounded good. So I got a lot of wild turkey donated that I'd make with beans and squash and corn and stuff like that. We still haven't gotten to the grown foods. We'll get to that next. But um, I made a lot of um, jerky, and they didn't have a lot of spices. So I tried mixing it with uh, juniper, with, uh, with actually eastern red cedar, like boughs and berries and things like that. And it kind of added a little bit of a taste. But it wasn't, it wasn't great. So it was probably just basic you know, jerky. And the one thing that they did that we know, because people still do it, is make pemmican. And pemmican is a trail food. Um, it's almost like a granola bar, except there's no granola in it. There's no oats in it. Uh, the pemmican could be vegetarian, which I show on the bottom, or meat-filled. And basically what it was was just dried meat, like jerky, with um, fat added to it. So it would, would have been like bear fat. Uh, or sunflower oil, um, sunflower seed oil. 
And then they'd probably add berries to it just to liven it up a little bit or use cornmeal for the vegetarian one. And it was just, sorry? Choke, choke cherries or, or any, any, any of the, you know, the service berry. That's what I always use because I couldn't find choke cherries. But the, uh, <clears throat> basically this is like a, a really long lasting uh, food that they didn't have to preserve in any way because everything was basically shelf stable. So the, and people still eat this stuff today all the time. And there's a guy named the sous chef who is, uh, his name is Sean Sherman, he's up in Minnesota, and he actually uh, makes these things um, and makes them into bars called, forget it, I can't remember his name, I can't remember what they call it, but um, he, he's the sous chef, S-I-O-U-X chef. Um, and he's really into, he's on the native food circuit right now, and he, he has um, his own brand of these things, so the pemmican is, I don't like it, it's gross, but it's definitely a shelf-stable food. So that's all I had on the meat, because I don't really focus too much on meat, but I had, to, I had to talk a little bit about it. Now, the grown foods are pretty quick, because most of it was what we call the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. Corn moved up. Uh, from, from Mexico, uh, 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 it was already domesticated down there, it was called teosinte. It has, it's this really like cruddy little plant that's got like seven little grains on it. Uh, and then the Mexicans were like, well, oh, this is fine. But then they found one that had eight grains, so they, you know. Anyway, eventually it turned into regular corn, made its way here, and then um, from one corn seed you can get, you know, millions and millions of pounds of corn. So it was a really good thing for feeding people, but not a good thing for keeping people healthy. Because uh, corn actually isn't very healthy. But when you mix it with beans, which were domesticated here earlier, and squash was domesticated here earlier, uh, it does make a complete, a complete meal. So it worked, it worked out pretty good when they got all three of those things together. Also things that were grown were sunflowers. Um, and Jerusalem artichoke, which is also called the sunchoke, it's a root plant. It's the only uh, starch vegetable that was native to the Americas. And I'll show you pictures of those in a second. Everybody thinks about corn, sweet corn. Everybody loves corn on the cob. But that's not the corn generally that they were growing. They were growing dried corn that would dry on the stalk and become either popcorn or corn that they would grind up or corn that they would turn into hominy. And I'll show you a couple pictures of those in a second. I, I got some, um, UCA used to have a program I can't remember what it was called, but they were seed savers, and now it, it resides, a, uh, uh, another iteration of that program resides at uh, Tech at Russellville, but they're a seed saver uh, place that has these old varieties of, of different kinds of things. So I had bloody butcher corn, which is a dense corn. Um, sometimes it didn't pollinate very well. I always had failures. Um, I also had raccoons, uh, so that usually messes things up. But I, I grew glass jam, and that's, that's become pretty popular nowadays from the uh, Seed Savers websites. Really beautiful popcorn. And um, a Flor de Rio popcorn. Um, and, and other just plainer corns that didn't look so nice, so I didn't take pictures of them. But I also experimented. I didn't look on the internet to how you make popcorn. Uh, so I ha it was so pretty, and I hung it up for like four months. And it turns out you dry it too much when you hang it for four months. So you have, that's why your Orville Redenbacher really does like go bad after a while because the moisture in the seeds go away and then it doesn't pop anymore. So then I had a lot of nice dried corn for decoration for forever. Um, it was sad. But we did get like, we got like the first year I did it, we got one bowl of popcorn. Like I was, you know, swatting kids' hands away because you, you don't appreciate it. I don't let the adults have my little like tiny bowl of popcorn. I eventually figured it out that you have to get it in the freezer pretty quick after you harvest so that it will pop. Uh, I, gr I did a lot of grinding of all the different kinds of corns uh, that we would eventually make these things into corn cakes and other fun things. My dad, you, you uh, f fried a lot of these one year. Um, so, you know, uh, corn cakes and all kinds of things, but probably the most important thing is hominy. If you get online and go to Google Scholar and look at hominy, um, people are now talking, there's this one woman, I think she's in Alabama studying hominy. She's got this whole great story, and I'm, not, I'm talking like I think it's fine. I don't, I'm not saying that this is a stupid story, but she's got this whole social uh, wrap up with hominy now where, where she thinks that because of research from Native Americans nowadays and talking to, to Native Americans that still kind of practice this tradition, that this was a thing that was passed down um, through the female line, and that like the the technique and the recipe for their hominy is is a f 
female social cohesion thing. And that like, you know, she's got this, I mean, it's a theoretical thing, of course, but it's still like a cool story to look at how food can really be part of your social life. And, and these hominy pot, there were special hominy pots that um, this woman in Alabama now recreates for experimental studies and things. Um, so she can cook in the pot and it's just a cool, a cool idea. And hominy is um, basically, if you haven't had it, it tastes like soggy popcorn. Um, it's pretty good. You make it, I make it from scratch. I don't ever buy the cans. And it's, you know, it's pretty good. You can get special hominy corn um, from, from different places. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it was a very important food that they probably made a lot of constantly. It was kind of that thing that was always cooking on the pot. Uh, I could go into making it, but you, we don't have time. Again, beans, you think about nice green beans, but really what they were doing was putting stuff up for storage so they'd let the beans dry on the vine. Did you know that almost all green beans that you let go to be big and then you dry them turn into dry beans? Like, there are very few green beans that won't eventually turn into a nice dry bean. People don't realize that. But I'm a really lazy gardener and all of my green beans go to this stage because I'm just too lazy. <laughs> So I just pick up the whole thing and, and take it in the house and shell them. Anyway, so you got the beans. That was the second part of the three sisters. Uh, I've grown all varieties over the years, um, just random. We don't have like, all the beans that we have in the archeology span are burnt. So you, can't, you don't know what color they were, right? So we don't know what they were. Um, and when they burn them, they get smaller. So we're not, we don't really know the species of bean. Uh, we just call it Fasulius, that's it. Fasulius species, and that's it. We don't really have good bean information. Maybe, Shayla, are you going to be our new bean expert in archaeology? You should do that. We have a whole, you could have a whole dissertation. Do it. Yeah, be the bean lady. Uh, and, then, and then the squash, um, the, again, no zucchini and stupid yellow squash. That stuff rots so fast. You got to make these big winter squashes. Um, then my favorite one is the Kushaw, that's this one. Um, and I had to put signs out because people would steal them at the park. So please leave this alone, it's for a program. Uh, but anyway, they're crazy and they, uh, they don't get decimated by the, the vine borers that most of our other squash do. And they're like big, big babies basically. They're these big giant things that feed like whole families one at a time. So anyway, the squash is another important thing. Uh, just pictures of, oh! The, what's fun though is you can dry squash and make like squash jerky. Huh. I don't know. It's I, again. I was trying to figure out ways that it would keep. Oh, but these kushaw actually. I had one that lasted an entire year on the floor, um, and you can open it up as long as there's no bugs or anything that got into it. You can. You, it saves for an entire year, and it's still perfectly edible on the inside. Um, and then sunflowers again are. We think of them as pretty. Uh, we, you know, it's really hard to find sunflower oil. I really look all the time, and you just don't, it's not as common anymore. But sunflower oil is what they were doing with this stuff. They weren't sitting at baseball games chewing on sunflower seeds. They were taking the entire sunflower after it dried out, and they were just grinding it up and putting it in water and letting the oil flow to the top. And then they were skimming the oil off and adding the oil to their food. Um, because again, the, the, the uh, meat was very lean, so they needed fat in their diet. The last one, and I said I, was, I have nine seconds left, are the sunchokes, and these things look like this. People have them in their gardens, um, but uh, they have a surprise underneath in that uh, they have a root that is edible. And they, it's like a potato, kinda. It looks like ginger. It doesn't really look like that here because it's dirty. But the, it looks like a ginger root, but it tastes nothing like ginger root. It tastes like a potato. Um, if you eat them raw, they are not called artichokes. They're called fartichokes, so watch out. But you can roast them, um, and they're really, you know, they're, they're, I, I just sliced them and made them into chips. Yeah, it's good. Now, the Indians weren't slicing them with a mandolin and putting them, you know. But I was just trying to find other ways to do it. And also, um, I found out one year that if you put the chips in the blender, it makes a powder that almost acts like gumbo filet, which is a thickener for soups. So you can use this as a thickener. Again, I don't think the Indians were really caring that their soup was, you know, aesthetically pleasing. And, but it's something, it's a thickener, and it, I'm sure it adds, you know, nutrition. So, see, I did it, and almost nine seconds over. So anyway, native plants are fun to learn about history, but they're also, um, evolved to our environment 
unlike the tomato. Uh, so, I mean, I grow, I grow tomatoes at home like crazy, but there are a lot of native ingredients that you can grow that are more resistant to the diseases and more resistant to the, um, you know, the, the hot heat of Arkansas summers. So if you, if you do choose to you know, have a garden, the, the native ones are probably the best to grow because they're the least problematic. Um, um, and, and they're good for our pollinators uh, because the, you know, the, all the native pollinators are used to the native plants and stuff like that. And it's also just fun to, to experiment with things that, you know, there's so many bean varieties and so many corn varieties, and it's just fun to have something other than yellow corn come out of the can at dinner, so. Okay. Yay. All right. Thanks.